Hi, this is Sean Woldenmuth. Welcome back to Coding Shorts. If this is your first time here, I hope you enjoy what I'm going to be showing you. But if you've been here before, I could use a like or subscribe just to help promote the channel. If there's a topic you'd like me to cover, please put it in the comments as well. I'm open to taking and showing you things that might be a little convoluted for you to learn on your own. But for today's topic, I want to talk about Vite and PWAs or progressive web applications. Vite has a plugin that will enable PWAs in a lot of the sorts of web applications you're going to be building. Of course, Vite supports Vue and React and Svelte and even plain old JavaScript projects. And so being able to support PWA at sort of an outside the framework level, I think is a pretty good solution. Let's take a look. So we're going to start directly in our Visual Studio Code project. This is actually a sub project inside of a .NET Core application that has an API. So we'll be able to use that. And we, in fact, we do in our existing project here in one of our views. Very simple view project, but again, this doesn't rely on view at all. It does rely on Vite, which we're using to actually run this. So we can see I'm already building the Vite project. And I might need to stop and restart this, but just to, so you can see what this looks like, this is our really simple application. There's just an API that's hit to pull down customer information, and we can click to call, we can go to home, really pretty simple things. Nothing's magical in here for what we want to do. One of the things that's missing is the ability to have a little icon up here that says, you can install my app or even you could build some UI in your website to install that as well. And that's because this doesn't pass any of those things that it needs to know that it's an installable application. Normally that would involve creating a WebSocket app. Normally that would involve writing your own WebSocket and utilizing the work. In order to support that, there's a few moving pieces. There's a manifest file that you have to create that has metadata about how your app is going to behave, as well as using a WebSocket in conjunction with the web box in Chrome in order to support running this without having to have a web server behind it. And so we want to be able to support that without having to write all that nitty gritty and frankly, fairly boilerplate code. So we're going to need a few things in our project that we don't have right now. And one of the interesting things here is we're going to try to do everything at a minimum. You might be expanding this to include more information than you want, but we're going to do, frankly, the least we can possibly do. Just go to my console and I want to add by installing the V plugin PWA. And because this is part of V, I'm going to use dash capital D to install it as a dev dependency instead of a regular dependency. Everything that this does, it does at build time, not at runtime. With that installed, we can now utilize it by going to our vite.config and we're just going to import it. Vite PWA from Vite plugin PWA. And this is going to be a plugin just like Vue or React or whatever plugins you're using in order to run this project. So I'm going to Tell it to just say Vite PWA with no parameters. Now we're going to come back and look at some parameters, but for now, this is all we really need. And so let's go ahead and rerun our application. Let's go ahead and rebuild the application. And we come back here, we'll see that we have our application here, but there is no magic button to install this app. But let's to see what it tried to do just so we can get a sense of it. If I go over here to Visual Studio, I'm using the .NET and Visual Studio and the or JavaScript or TypeScript in my case with Visual Studio Code, it's been building into this folder here called WW root. And because we've added this V, we've actually added through a couple new files. So here's the manifest. This is a manifest that contains information about your application actually needs a little more than the manifest is creating so far. And I'll show you how to do that. There's a register service worker. There's a service worker, actual file that's executed. And then this workbox, which integrates with the workbox to do the things you need. Now, while these exist, you're never going to be dealing with them directly. In fact, one thing you might notice is if we look at the index.html, 
not only has it linked that the manifest is here, but also to load in that register SW for the service worker, right? All of this is being done at build time. So let's go ahead and make it actually work. Now inside of the PWA here, inside the vite.config, it allows you to pass in an object, has some options. And there's a ton of these options in there that you can tweak. But we're going to really do the minimum, which is to say that I want my manifest to have a couple of properties. And the only one we really need to make this all work is an array of icons. And we only need one icon. And I happen to have icons here in our assets. And if we open up the public folder, we'll see that there's a number of icons here for our application. We're just going to define a single icon. So normally you would have different sizes for different applications. So some Android and iPhone and desktop and Windows and Mac and all of that might have their own sets of icons. And so this is just going to have a source, which is going to be icons, let's say 512.png, which just specifies the size we want. Sizes is going to equal 512x512. Type is going to be image PNG, which is just the MIME type. And this specific one is going to be purpose any maskable. So we have a transparent background on all our icons, like you probably should do, but this is just allowing us to really specify them. Now that we've made that change, let me just stop this and run it again. Because we've changed the config, it doesn't know to restart our watch. And if we refresh this, we can actually see up here app available now that we've added this icon to our manifest. And if you're curious, you can actually look at the manifest, dot web manifest. We can see all the information that's given us for this. It has the one icon, it has the background color, standalone, all these other things that we may actually change in our own small piece of the manifest. But th this being read by the browser so we can install the app here, I'm going to go ahead and install it as a PWA. And that's all fine, right? We have it running. We're pretty happy. But what happens if we use the tools and we change this to offline? What happens? Our app is still here. And what it's done is actually if we look at the application tab in the tooling, you'll see a few things. First, you'll see the service worker. This is a service worker that's actually going to be serving the files for our application as we need it. And there's this special workbox cache. And what's in here? This is everything it determined that we needed to run our application. So you can see some JavaScript files. You can see the PNG, the index. And they have some special revisions so it knows that if there's a new version, we should go ahead and pull that over. So all that's interesting. But the reason that this application is still failing is that it can't make the network call. So let's go to network. And we can see that a couple of things didn't ca get cached. Fave icon, but most importantly, this customers, because we're considered offline, is failing. Right? And that's the API call, API customers, that is going and getting our data. So we might want to actually cache more than we're looking at here. So with the app closed, let's come back here. And we can actually do this here inside the Vite PWA. We can actually add another object. So we can come here and say Workbox. And Workbox is going to allow to us to make some specifications that are going to change the way the browser is going to utilize things. And one of the things we want to support is something called runtime caching. And runtime caching are caches that you're going to specify. And we're going to use this for our APIs. So we're only going to specify one runtime cache. And we're going to specify a your, an URL pattern for it to look at. This can take a regular expression. This can take a fixed string. Or it can take a function. And for us, we're going to actually utilize this as a function. So the function is going to pass in an object that contains URL, but we only need URL, so I'm going to destructure that here. And then what am I going to return? This is essentially a test to see whether it actually can be cached or should be cached. And all I'm going to do is say URL.pathName, 
which is everything from the slash after the domain name, but not the query string. And I'm just going to say, if this starts with API, and we're seeing an error here because the runtime caching requires a couple other pieces. So we're going to first say our handler, and this is a named handler for the type of handler you want to do. And for us, we could say, look at the cache first and the network second, look at the network first and the cache second, or only use the cache or the network. In our case, we're just going to say cache first here, and we're going to tell it that we want this as const. And then we're going to have some options. What are we going to do once we see these calls that need to be cached? Pretty simply, we're going to give it a cache name. I'll call this our API cache, for lack of a better name. And then how does how do we know that it's a cacheable response? We're actually going to say cacheable response is rules for things that match that URL but may or may not be cacheable. And so what we're going to actually do is say for us, statuses of 0 or 200 are both cacheable. Let's just make sure that we're getting a valid so it doesn't cache something that maybe is a 201 or a 202. And remember, because we're doing this caching, this really is only caching gets. That's an important idea here. If you need something less automatic, you might want to go ahead and look at writing to local cache and handling in your application. I think in our case, caching these API results will help us give a better experience when we are actually offline. With all of that working, let's go ahead and rebuild it. Probably didn't have to, but this whole PWA in the browser I found to be a little touchy. And so I've been rerunning the builds. And so back here, remember we could do this in the browser or as a separate app. We're getting the basis both ways is that we have our cache offline, but this is working, right? Obviously if I go no throttling, it's going to get all the new versions. And if I go offline again, this continues to work with the APIs. But how do we know that? Again, let's go over to our application. We can now see our cache contains an API cache that we created. And what it did was it cached the request here in the browser so that we can go ahead and show those 100 customers even when we're completely offline. So that's the crux of it. Pretty straightforward. You can see down in the notes a link to the GitHub repo that contains this as well as all the other Coding Shorts examples. And I hope that uh, this helps you get up to speed with PWAs without having to write all your own code by hand. This plugin for V I find super useful. And there'll be a lot more information in the blog post that accompanies this where we talk about some of the other minutia. If you've gotten this far, don't forget that you can like and subscribe. It really helps the channel helps get the word out. Of course, you could share it with your social media as well. Everything helps trying to build that audience that I think wants this kind of content. Add comments if you have any questions or have any concerns or disagree with me. Let's have that conversation in the comments. Well, this has been Sean Wilding with, with Coding Shorts again. Thanks for joining me.